Well, I am extremely excited about the adventure that we are about to embark upon, and I'm going to be sharing over the next few sessions on the rhythms of God's grace, the rhythms of God's grace in our lives, and how that Jesus has come, and there is this thing we call grace that we need to dive into, and I hope to be able to take a deep dive into the dimensions of grace, to the amazingness of God's grace. So many of God's people have lost the amazing in amazing grace, and I'm believing for the amazing to come back to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in this session, we're gonna deal with rest and a supernatural rest that Jesus has brought to us and how to enter into that, into that rest. If you have your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor. I'm in the King James, but I believe they put the new King James up there. So let me start over. Verse 28 says the same thing. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There is a place in Jesus and our relationship with Jesus that there's these rhythms of his grace that brings rest to our lives. And we live in a world that is filled with stress and not rest. And Jesus is teaching us here how to live a stress-free life, how to be free from worry, from anxiety, from all types and kinds of fear. And we need to understand that rhythm of grace in our lives and make sure that we enter into that rest that's been made available for us. I don't know that I'm ever going to be able to teach on the lessons from COVID-19. These are personal things in my life that my relationship with the Lord, it seems like I enjoy my personal relationship with the Lord and the lessons that he's teaching me as a leader in the body of Christ in regards to what we've gone through over COVID-19. And I'm convinced that the majority of the body of Christ was not only unprepared for COVID-19, but are woefully unprepared for what's on the horizon. And fear and worry and anxiety, stress, dominated not only our, our world during this pandemic, but it also dominated the hearts of too many of God's people. And it, it disheartened me to see that fear was as rampant within the church as it was in the world and worry and anxiety. And the Lord had given me specific words, rhema words, on how to deal with this pandemic, COVID-19, how to position ourselves, how to stand, how to overcome. And yet it was like God's people did not have an intimate relationship with the Lord enough to find the grace to overcome all the fear, all the worry, all the anxiety and all the stress. And not only did the majority of God's people not know how evidently to find grace in such a time of need, but when I'd try to deal with certain issues, the lessons again, I've learned as a leader, how little discernment the church has at large concerning the things that are coming upon the earth, how, how little wisdom we really operate in how shallow, and I'm not trying to condemn anybody or be critical. I'm trying to be honest and evaluate. And if we're not honest in our evaluation, then we're not gonna be prepared for what's coming next because I promise you COVID-19 was just a dress rehearsal and we couldn't even handle somebody trying to talk to us about mask. Yeah. Yeah. And how that this is a virus. 
and how that if you wanted to wear a mask, I got so falsely accused. It, the lesson I learned is God's people at large don't have an ear to hear because I would be so specific that if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. We love you. We're not going to shame you for wearing a mask, but you can't mask shame me in my understanding that that mask in stopping a virus, a microscopic virus is as effective as a chain link fence stopping a mosquito. And, and yet I offended everybody. We didn't have an ear to hear and we didn't understand grace and the power of God's grace in our lives and rhythms of grace to where we would even have an ear to hear that I've got nothing against vaccines. I told you that it wouldn't stop with one shot, but it would be shot after shot, booster after booster. This was at the beginning and it offended God's people because fear dominated their heart. Worry was dominating their heart. They were stressing out over this thing. And so they didn't have an eye to see and an ear to hear. And no matter how I tried to say, I'm talking about vaccine mandates is the spirit of antichrist. And they couldn't hear me. Take them right over to Revelation and say that the spirit of antichrist and the mark of the beast will be that you won't be able to buy or sell unless you receive the mark of the beast. And yet I'm trying to prepare us in this dress rehearsal that if the government can mandate a shot, why can't they ma mandate 20 shots, 40 shots? If they can mandate a shot, if they can take this, the sovereignty of your body truly away from you, what can they do in the future? And yet, and yet, because people didn't have these rhythms of grace that Jesus just revealed in their lives, they simply couldn't hear what the Spirit of the Lord was saying. And I fear for them in a godly fear on what's coming next that they will be unprepared for. All I can do is learn lessons from COVID-19 and make sure I teach you how to develop rhythms of grace in your life how to be loyal to Jesus, how to be sensitive to Jesus, how to, to have a faith in his amazing grace that'll cause you to stand. And after doing all to stand, you'll stand there for being clothed with God, clothed with the armor, the armor of God. One of the reasons I'm going on national TV is because I saw how unequipped God's people at large were We've got to get the message of his amazing grace out to the body of Christ to get ready for the things that are on the horizon. So this will be an adventure that I pray that you can be with us on. I'm going to take the adventure, whether you come with me or not. I'm going to grow in grace, whether you grow in grace or not. And I'm going to continue to develop these rhythms of grace that Jesus just revealed that'll bring a rest to my soul a rest to my heart that I won't stress in all the things that are coming upon the earth, that are coming upon the earth. So what are the, the rhythms of grace that Jesus revealed? Let me give you all three and then we'll break them down and then we're gonna dive deeper each week. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So the first rhythm of his amazing grace is learning to come to him, come to him, come to a person. And on and on I'll go in that. The second rhythm of grace is take my yoke upon you. Make sure you're yoked up to me, not Dr. Death, not Dr. Fauci, not politicians. Make sure you're married to Jesus and you're loyal to Jesus above all other loyalties in this life. Yoke up with me. Yet I saw people yoked up to the six o'clock news. I saw them yoked up to politicians that are lying and frauds and deceivers and are under literally demonic spirits. 
And yet I would talk about Jesus and let's come to Jesus with this and let's remain yoked up to Jesus. And oh no, their allegiance to everything but Jesus caused their heart to stress, worry and fear and anxiety to overtake them. It's a sad day still in the church that we're yoked up to everything at large but Jesus. We're still basically led by our flesh. We're basically and have a yoke and a loyalty to our flesh. Even in the church, race is more important at large than God's grace. And I'm here to tell you, grace is more important than race because I'm to know no man now after the flesh, but after the new creation that the grace of God has brought to me. I'm not saying race issues don't matter. See, I make those statements and there's meltdowns because people are yoked to their flesh. They have more an allegiance to their flesh than to Jesus, the savior of their heart and lives. And so the first rhythm is come to Jesus. The second rhythm of grace is being yoked up to him and taking his yoke upon you as you face the challenges of this life as you face the meltdown that is going to continue within our culture, you need to be yoked up to Jesus. And then the third rhythm of grace is learn of me, learn of me. The first two are actually achieved in number three, learning of Jesus, learning, knowing Jesus and his commitment to you, knowing Jesus and his faithfulness to you, knowing Jesus and his loyalty to you is what makes the first three even more effective. So let's go through the first one, the first, ryth first rhythm, and then we're gonna get into definitions of grace. The first rhythm that is amazing to me is that Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden. And again, I will give you rest. Notice in Matthew there, eleven twenty eight, 28, the first rhythm is to come unto a person. Come unto a person, not a doctrine, not a teaching, not a philosophy. There is no spiritual authority that has ever risen on this planet that has made that claim. Even the false messiahs, even the false prophets, no one has ever made the claim, come unto me and I will give you rest. They say, come unto my teachings, come unto my methods, come unto my doctrine, come unto my great revelation of transcendental, trans, trans, trans something, meditation. Trans, is it? That's what I said, transcendental. I don't care what you heard. That is what I said, transcendental meditation. And, and, and I will teach you how to be one with the universe, the cosmos, and even God. Why in the world would I need somebody to have to teach me how to be one with God when Jesus Christ has come and join my spirit to himself. And I'm already one with the Lord. One spirit through grace and simple childlike faith. So Jesus didn't say, come unto this and you'll find rest. Come unto this system, come unto to this strategy, come unto this, you fill in the blank that everybody is trying to come to to find rest. He said, come unto me, have a relationship with me and you will find rest for your souls. You won't be burdened down with all this cultural rot, with all this fraud, with all this deception that is creating fear and worry and division and chaos. The reason the church is collapsing as much as the country is we've come unto everything but Jesus. And we need to learn to come back to him. We need to learn this rhythm of grace in our life. Come unto me and you will find rest for your souls. John 14, six, 
Jesus said, I am not a way, a truth, a life. Come unto me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We have to keep coming to Jesus. A lot of people will come to Jesus to get saved, but as soon as they come to Jesus to get saved, they look to family for the source of peace and rest. And They look to media. They look to politicians. They look to political parties. They, you fill in the blank. And Jesus is saying, don't come to me just to get forgiven of your sins. And I'll teach you in our next session, after you come to me and I unite your spirit to my spirit, keep coming to me because you're going to start feeling burdened. You'll, you'll, you'll sense burden and you'll sense heaviness and you have to keep coming to me to find that rest. Brothers and sisters, if you're experiencing a spiritual hernia, you've picked up something besides what the Lord's called you to pick up. Y'all didn't catch that? Man, I meet people all the time. Dear God, you're... You have a spiritual hernia, brother. You're picking up stuff God didn't call you to pick up. You're coming to everything. You're looking to everything but Jesus, the author now and finisher of your faith. And you wonder why you're burdened. You wonder why you have no peace. You wonder why you're struggling with this heaviness. You don't have to wonder anymore. Come back to Jesus. Develop a personal, intimate relationship with him, and that takes me to the number two rhythm of his amazing grace, is after you come unto me, take my yoke upon you. Again, we have the picture of two oxen that have been yoked together as one, and they're not going in two separate directions. They're not living independent of one another. Listen to me, they have a partnership in labor. Let that sink in for a minute. Yoke and the symbol of yoke and being yoked to Jesus, he's saying the two are one in the concept of a yoke and don't try to live your life independent of me. Don't try to go your own way. Don't lean to your own understanding, but learn to acknowledge me in all your ways and I'll direct your path. Don't, don't get spoiled through philosophies of this world, Colossians 2.8, vain deceit, fraud all around you. Traditions, the traditions of, of our families and culture and the rudiments, basic elementary principles of this world that are under demonic delusion. Stay yoked up to me, be married to me. When you get saved, saints, one of the things that we need to be taught, I mean, right out of the gate, is you got married. And those of you that are single, you're just going to have to hang on for a minute. 99% of you, it's God's will that you be married, and one day you're going to get a rude awakening. That things change when you get married. Yeah, it's like, all them buddies you used to hang out with, you can't be hanging out with anymore. Amen. Amen. Well, honey, I, I told him to go home before midnight. That worked fine when you were single, but that won't work when you're married. Things change. And I wonder how many people get saved and, and never get the revelation of how things have changed. You, you're, you're dependent upon another now. You're united to another now. You're living life with another. You're in partnership with another and your loyalties lie with your spouse. One of the things that's amazing, and I, I won't be able to explain it now. I don't even know if we'll get back to it. I, I will before the Lord returns, but I, I don't know if I'll get back to it in this particular series, but Galatians chapter five, verse one says, stand fast, therefore in the liberty 
wherein Christ has made you free and be not yoked again to bondage. And if you'll keep reading just the next few verses, he's talking about the law and being yoked to the law, married to the law. A lot of people look to grace to get saved. They look to Jesus to save them, but then they look to Moses and the law to be holy. They can't divorce themselves from legalism. They can't divorce themselves from rules and regulations uh, to be made righteous in the eyes of God or be blessed in the eyes of God or receive something from God. Man, when you meet Jesus, you got to leave and now cleave to the Lord. You've got to come out from under the law and realize you're married now to Jesus. And some of you just haven't been under the law long enough. I lived under it long enough that I can say with conviction and boldness, the law is a bad husband. Constantly demanding and demanding and demanding and you can never please him. You can never measure up. You can never do enough to be blessed. You can never do enough or do it right enough to get healed. And yet people are married still to the law and have missed this rhythm of grace in their life that Jesus is our hero husband. Unlike that bad husband that I'm divorced from, I'm no longer under. That was so demanding and I could never please. My new husband, Jesus, not only demands righteousness out of me, but looks at me as his bride, as his wife, and says, but I'll be your righteousness. I'll be everything you need for the rest of your life. Boy, that's amazing grace. What a rhythm to develop in your life. What a rhythm of grace that I feel myself looking to and and coming back into bondage and yoked up to something, rules, regulations, rituals, legalism, to get something from God. When I have been given in his amazing grace, every single thing God has in this man, Jesus. And so you have to learn to take, everybody say take, take, take my yoke upon you. And then he says the third rhythm of his amazing grace is learn of me. Learn of me. I had a manuscript sent off to multiple editors. I shouldn't tell that, that just came to me. Praise the Lord. And the editors would send it back, always changing, learn about God. Learn about Jesus. And I'd have to correct the editors. No, I'm saying it this way for a specific reason. Many people know about God, but don't know God. Jesus is saying, learn of me. Jesus is saying, this is eternal life, John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they might know me, that they might know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Everything is about learning of Jesus. All of your problems, that the source is the enemy trying to separate you from God, a wise, well-taught Christian, in all of those problems that are trying to separate me from God, separate me from God's people, drive me to intimacy with God, and Jesus shows me something of himself in every problem I have. He reveals himself. He says, hey, hey, come here, let me give you a secret. You don't have to do this and do that and try to find peace. I am your peace. I'm the Prince of Peace. Just look at me, just get focused on me and all of a sudden, peace will start to surge your heart and your mind because I am 
what you need in every problem. I am what you need. Learn of me. Stay yoked up to me. Be my partner. I don't have time for this full testimony, but when our church burnt down in Durant and I'm standing in the parking lot and my heart is just sinking and I'm hearing people crying all around me because the sanctuary that all the weddings had taken place in, we had celebrate and celebrated spouses that had gone home. On and on I could go with the memories of, of weddings and funerals and people getting saved in that building and it's all burning down to the ground. And had I not known the rhythms of God's grace, I know I wouldn't be here now and our church wouldn't be where it's at now. But I'm standing in the parking lot <laughs> and I just, I just stopped for a minute. I'm watching the fire and I thought, come unto me, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And so I, I looked up and I said, Jesus, I, I hate to have to tell you this, but you have a problem. <laughs> I don't have a problem. You said you would build the church and the gates of hell, fire, would not prevail against it. So you have a problem. Now, I don't know how you're gonna work this out, but I'll make a deal with you. Don't get discouraged, Lord. I won't leave or forsake you. I'll stick with you, right? I'll, I'll stick with you. So don't, don't give up on this. Don't, don't get discouraged because I'm just gonna keep coming to you. I'm gonna remain yoked up to you and I'm gonna learn something of you as I watch you work all things out and together for my good because I love you so much, Jesus, and I'm called according to your purpose, which is to be conformed into your very image. Because I knew what I'm teaching you now, I had total rest, standing there in the parking lot watching the church burn down. And everybody laughs at me, and I appreciate some people that have a, a sense of humor. I'll say things, and it's just my humor. And, and I can't help it because you have bad humor but some people with good humor will laugh when I say, you know, Lord, I, I won't leave you on this one. I'll stick with you. Stay in yoke. Take my yoke upon, upon you. See, I've been pastoring a long time. I've been ministering a long time. And I guarantee you when stuff happens, people quit coming to Jesus. They don't stay yoked up to him and they don't learn anything of his amazing grace in all the trials of life. And yet when you learn these rhythms, everything you face It'll become second nature, these rhythms, these disciplines of grace. See, grace is not opposed to discipline. It's opposed to earning or deserving anything from God. Disciplines are godly, godly things that the Holy Spirit works into our life. And God wants to work these three rhythms into your life so that everything you face, I'm going to come to Jesus in it. I'm going to take his yoke upon me. And Lord, I'm going to learn of you in this. I'm gonna fellowship with you in your sufferings. See, many of you, I love you, but when you're suffering, you think, and that was a word from God that Zach gave, when you're suffering, you really aren't sure God really cares. You have no concept of him suffering and that you're supposed to fellowship with him in these sufferings. Then no matter what you're going through, there's grace there. No matter what you're going through, Jesus is there. He's not the one doing any bad thing to you, but he wants to reveal his presence to you in bad things. He wants to, to reveal his partnership and reveal his power. Paul said, I want to know you in the power of your resurrection and in the fellowship of your sufferings. See, when you're feeling rejected, Jesus has been there. And the only reason you're being rejected is because of the Spirit of Christ in you and the Spirit of God upon you. You wouldn't be rejected by this world if you were of the world. You wouldn't be hated by the world, Jesus said, if you were of the world. But because you are not of them, they hated him, they'll hate you. And so you have to learn to fellowship with him in all these sufferings of navigating through a fallen world. And how do you do that? Rhythms of grace. All right, so let's talk about grace. That was my introduction. And as we go through, 
What, what did I say? That was my introduction. And as we go through these rhythms, you will begin to develop this in your everyday practical life. I, I, I've already asked the Lord, please don't let me spend my valuable time just in theology. There's a theology to grace, but many people have heard the theology but don't understand the practicality of his amazing grace in your everyday life. So I hope to get past that into these practical rhythms of his grace in our lives. So we're gonna look at two primary things with my remaining time, and that is what is grace? What is grace and where is grace? Go to 1 Corinthians 15. One of the most amazing statements in scripture is 1 Corinthians 15. And this is Paul, and he's going to, going to give us the biblical definition of, of grace. 1 Corinthians 15. Before I get there, let's deal with the basic understanding of most people in regards to grace. When you say grace, most people who attend church who've attended church, got away, and then came back, or are even new to church culture, there's a dominant definition of grace that they basically understand. But if you don't get past that basic definition of grace, you're, you're not going to understand how grace applies to your life, your everyday life, and your walk yes. through the trials of this life. And so the basic understanding of God's grace in the, in the original language, it's charis. So I'm not going to spend any time on that here. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let here take care of charis. And so the dominant definition, and many translations, even the Amplified Bible is one, uses this phrase, unmerited favor, unmerited favor, a favor. In other words, a favor that we can't merit. We have God's favor and we didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. It's unmerited. And while that definition is not incorrect, it's incomplete. Because if that's all you know about grace, unmerited favor, if you have unmerited favor, then you've got all the favor there is. So how could you get more grace? There's scriptures that talk about more grace. If I already have all of God's favor, it's unmerited. How could I get any more of it? Grace and peace. Second Peter chapter one, verse two. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that's back to one of those rhythms of learn of me. Hallelujah. My grace and level of grace and practicality is connected to how much I have learned of him. It can be multiplied. If it's unmerited, why did James chapter one and first Peter chapter five say there's something we can do to get more of it? I had all these questions. And I had an open vision of the cross in May of 1980, and I saw the grace of God. I saw the gospel, the gospel of grace. I saw my communion and union with Christ and literally the death of my old man, the burial of my old man, the resurrection of my new man, and the seating of my new man in heavenly places in a vision. And that embodies God's grace. And yet my understanding of that has grown exponentially over the years. As I've learned to keep coming to him, stay yoked up to him and learn of him. So while there is an unmerited favor, I have to say that lest everybody shut me down that okay, He's challenging unmerited favor. No, I've established unmerited favor and that it is 
And part of grace is the unmerited, the undeserved, unearned favor of God. But Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 teaches us what grace does. See, grace is something, unmerited favor, but grace does something. And a lot of people never get to the grace does something. They understand, hey, I have the favor of God and it's unmerited. But Titus chapter two, verse 11 says, the grace of God that brings salvation to all men has appeared to all men teaching us to deny ungodliness, worldliness. Grace literally teaches you to live holy. And grace, grace not only teaches us to live holy, it teaches us how to live holy. Amen. I think I've already lost the crowd. Grace is something, unmerited favor, but grace does something. It teaches us how to deny all this ungodliness, worldliness, evil in our world. And yet many people have never got to grace does. And so this definition is amazing to me right out of Paul's experience in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse 10. But by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace toward me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Amen and amen. I'm gonna break that down here in a minute. But if grace is just unmerited favor, how could you fall from it? Galatians chapter five. How could you frustrate it? Galatians 2, 21. See, grace isn't just unmerited favor. Grace is the power to be and the power to do that you don't have the power. Grace is the power to be a new creation and to do the works of Jesus. The works of Jesus. Paul said that here. Look at this. I am what I am by the grace of God. See, grace is... God's power is what makes you a new creation. Grace, God's power is what makes you righteous. You cannot in your own power and human ability be made the righteousness of God. So what makes us righteous? What makes us who we are? New creations, heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus. What is it that makes us these things? It's God's grace. God's grace made him who he was. Grace makes you an apostle. You can't just wake up one day and decide, that's a good idea, I'll be an apostle. No, you'll be a dead apostle. <laughs> grace makes you a pastor. You can't be a pastor without grace. Amen. See, Paul said, I am who I am, not by my natural ability, not by natural power, not by my, my just free will, I chose to be this. No, I am what I am, by the grace of God, I am saved by the grace of God. What's that mean? God's power has saved me, not my own power. God's ability demonstrated in Jesus and the cross has made me who I am, not my own ability. In John chapter one, verse 11 says that Jesus came unto his own and they rejected him. But as many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. It was God's power that saved you. What was that? Grace. It was God's power that justified you. What was that? Grace. It was God's power that made you an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. What was that power? It was grace. To as many as receive him, John 1, 12, gave he the power to become the sons of God. To as many as believed on him and received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. What was that power? It was his amazing grace. So it's God's grace that makes me a pastor. It's God's grace that, that makes me righteous. It's God's grace that makes me who I am. But look at the second part of the verse. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored, I labored, 
I labored more abundantly than they all. Than they all who? All the other apostles, all the other disciples. If you go back and read the humility, because this sounds arrogant, if you take it out of its context, the verses before this, he said, I'm not worthy to even be called an apostle. I don't deserve this. I didn't earn this. I persecuted the church. I held the coats of those that stoned Stephen. I drugged people out of their homes and beat them till they renounced Jesus. He went on in his testimony to talk about how, how God had mercy on him because he did all that in ignorance. Then he says, but I am who I am, not by works of righteousness, which I have done, but by the grace of God. And I labored more abundantly than they all, look at this, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. I am who I am by grace, but listen, I do what I do, not in human ability, not in human strength, not in human power. I not only am something by God's amazing grace, all my labor, all my doing is the grace of God that's not in vain in my life. Hallelujah. When you understand the grace to be and the grace to do, even when you begin to see the fruit of holiness in your life, you don't boast on how holy you are and how good you are and how you're better than anybody else. You know it was grace that saved me and made me righteous and truly holy. And now it's that same grace that's producing holiness in my life as I come to Jesus, stay yoked up to him and learn of him. Hallelujah. And somebody needs to give God praise. I know some of you don't have a clue on what I just said. Because a lot of people will accept grace to get saved, but thanks for introducing me to the kingdom, Jesus. I'll take over from here. And they become heavy laden and burdened and an, and an, uh, uh, an enemy of the cross where God's grace was demonstrated and now is released through the preaching of the cross. I am what I am by God's amazing grace and I do what I do by that same grace. There's a power to be something and there's a power to do something now through childlike faith and it's called the amazing grace of God. The amazing grace of God. And so we wanna learn how to be a new creation, grace, and do the works of Jesus, grace in our lives, in our lives. Now here's where I get excited. Where is grace? Where is grace? Write down 2 Timothy there, chapter two. I'm gonna have to turn over there and read it. They'll put it up on the screen. 2 Timothy chapter two, verse one. 2 Timothy two, verse one. My son, you therefore my son, a father in the faith, speaking to a son of the faith, Paul, a father speaking to a son, Timothy. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Where is grace? It's in Jesus. It's not in our doctrines. It's not in teaching. Where is grace? It's in Jesus. That's why if you want grace to be and grace to do, you have to come unto Jesus, be yoked up to Jesus and learn of him because he is God made flesh. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. You cannot have grace to be or grace to do independent of a relationship with Jesus. That's why you see so many people sitting in church that mentally know some things about the Bible, but have no victory in their lives. They can't overcome all this division, all this hate, all this death. Because they don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus. They don't have grace to be what God's called them to be or grace to do what God's called them to do because they don't know where it is. They think it's in coming to church. Now don't misunderstand me, please come to church. 
this is where we are supposed to be taught grace. And, but this is where we l learn of him and how grace works when somebody sits in your seat. When someone acts the fool. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about the people that didn't come. <laughs> this is one reason people won't connect to a good church because this is where we live in grace. This is not where we talk about grace. This is where we experience grace. So be strong in the grace that is in Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men. That word men in the Greek concordance includes male and female, mankind, who will be able to teach others also. The, the things you've heard about me, you've seen in me, I've modeled it. There's this concept, man, oh man, I don't have enough time. Where is grace? It's in Jesus. Go to, go to Hebrews chapter four. Verse 15 was quoted from the podium, not knowing my outline, which blesses me, so I won't read it. We're talking about where is grace? Look at verse 16. Because we have this high priest, because we, we have a high priest that is God, but God made flesh, that within this mystery, Jesus is fully God, 100% God, but listen, he's fully man, 100% man. And so he understands us. He connects with us. He says, let us come therefore boldly to the throne of what? The throne of grace. Aren't you glad it, it didn't say, let us come boldly to the throne of law? Aren't you glad it didn't say, let us come boldly to the throne of wrath? No, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Where is grace? Well, you, you gave the right answer, but I didn't set you up for a better complete answer. I'm impressed that you said Jesus, but where is Jesus? Come boldly to the throne of grace. Why is it? Oh, 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 got excited. Stay calm, stay calm. Come boldly to the throne. And why is it called the throne of grace? Because of who's sitting on it that's full of it. Now watch this. Come boldly to the throne of grace. This is pretty incredible. That you may obtain mercy and find grace, find grace, find grace to help in time of need. Not only does this, does this reveal where grace is, this reveals a mystery within God's people of when you find grace. See, grace can't be earned or deserved, but it has to be found. Grace cannot be earned. It cannot be deserved. You have to go to a throne. Come unto Jesus. If I come unto Jesus and I'm yoked up to Jesus and I'm learning of him, where will I be? At a throne. And I'll find grace when? In time of need. Grace can't be stored up. It's the manna. Ooh, Jesus, I love you. It's, oh, I don't get chicken skin very often. It's the manna that came down from heaven that Jesus is and as I feed on him, I'm feeding on God's amazing grace that makes me who I am and empowers me to do what I do. Hallelujah. And when do I find it? In time of need. I can't store it up. I only find it when I'm hurting. I only find it when I'm confused. I only find it when I'm weak.
man, that's going to sink in. At least five of you are going to get this. I, I could, man, I could use six of you to help me out as we grow and as I give you this new announcement that's coming at the end of this. We, we, we've got to realize that grace is found in time of need. Not when everything's going great. Not when I'm feeling good. It's bam, I got hit by a demonic nuclear ballistic missile. Some of you, bless your hearts, you're still in the fiery dark zone of enemy warfare. Hitting your little bitty shield. Fiery dark, fiery dark. Man, I'm at a place in God now where I'm hearing intercontinental nuclear ballistic missiles coming out of hell. I need some grace. I need more grace. I need more power and ability to be what I don't have the power and ability to be. And I need more power and God's ability to do what he's called me to do. And where am I going to find it? Stay calm. I don't want to preach or scream or holler. I don't even want to sweat. I want to relax. Where is it? It's at a throne. Why is it at a throne? I have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I can't be playing games and overcoming this last day. I can't overcome COVID-19, COVID-20 and 21 and 23 and 24 that'll come up for the next five elections. Boy, we're, stu we're just so slow. I find it in time of need, when I'm hurting, when I'm weak, when I'm confused, when I'm out of gas in the natural. I got to show you one scripture. I'm in, the, I'm in the red already so that, remember, the best messages in the Bible are in the red. So, <laughs> I just find that I'm always in the red when I have the, the punch. Go to, go to Exodus because this concept of finding grace is throughout the scriptures. Yet I attended church my entire, other than that backslidden state that I've given my testimony over as a young person I went to church. I never heard a message like this. I never heard what grace is, where you can find grace. This is why prayer, see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but grace comes from praying. It comes from intimately fellowshipping with Jesus in your weakness, human weakness. It comes from partnership with Jesus. It, it's only found at a throne. Amen. Exodus 33, verse 12. If you'll, if you'll go back and just look up grace, it is profound. How many scriptures say, and they found grace in the sight of God, and they found grace, they found grace, they found grace. They didn't earn grace. They didn't deserve grace. They didn't merit grace, but they had to find it. Noah, it says in Genesis, that Noah found grace in the sight of God. Joshua Joseph found grace in the sight of God. Amen. Moses here, and this is so good. I picked it out of dozens because it, it, it ties everything I'm saying up. Um, look at verse 12, Exodus 33, 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you also found grace in my sight. Moses didn't earn God's grace. He didn't deserve God's grace, but he, he found it. Amen. Now look at how it expounds. This gets so good. Now, therefore, I pray. I what? I pray. Where is grace? It's at a throne. Now, therefore, I pray if I have found grace in your sight. Show me now your way that I may know you 
that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. Look at this. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you what? The byproduct of grace, the byproduct of being at the throne, the byproduct of coming unto Jesus, being yoked and staying yoked to him and learning of him will always result in his presence in your life, bringing rest to your soul. Wow. Wow. Man, I tell you what, I've known this stuff for decades and I am so glad I came. I needed to hear this. I'm excited. We all need renewed in what is grace? Where is grace? When do we find it? In time of need. And yet how many people, the minute trouble hits, the minute a tribulation, an affliction, a disappointment that has positioned you to find grace, you run from God instead of to God. When that church was burning down, <laughs> man, I knew I got to come to Jesus. I got to take his yoke and learn of him. And I found grace in time of need. I found a grace that up to that point I hadn't found standing in a parking lot. You may not know me, but I know me. I know all my weaknesses. I know all my complexes. I know all my flesh that's no good. And to find in my time of need, right there in a parking lot, a grace that sustained me, that led me, and God's presence through that trial for not only me, my family, my two sons literally moved into the burnt church, one part of the church burnt to the ground, the original church, and my two sons moved in to the other facility that had to be gutted that we are in right now in Durant, that location, and lived on the property 24-7 for three months in restoring the church. A grace came upon my family is my point that we hadn't experienced of that's when our church became my children's church because they found grace in time of need. Man, that is powerful. I could preach all day. No, you won't sit there. Father, I love you and I thank you, Jesus.